As the film and the different GoPros from October 7th was brought to our attention, each scene, for those who have seen it, it's going to hit us in different ways. You know, for me, at the music festival, I kept on hearing an Israeli police officer saying, he may die, he may die, he may die. She's dead, she's dead, she's dead. And as we continue to pick up the broken pieces, we keep on learning of unique stories from the victims. And one in particular that I want to mention because I think it's fitting. At the festival, there was someone named Bruna Veleno. She was a, a recently a new immigrant from Brazil. She had very few friends and family. It was just her mother and her sister who lived in Israel, but they made Eliyahu to, to start a new life in their indigenous homeland. Her mother didn't know she was kidnapped but later learned that she was murdered. Her fear was that Bruna, for her funeral, wouldn't have a minion. And for Israel, that would be 10 men who couldn't be there to accompany the dead for burial and our obligation to comfort the mourner. Thousands of people showed up for Bruna to make sure that she had a Jewish burial in accordance to Jewish law, but more importantly, for her mother and for her sister, that the Israelis aren't a country embodied with strangers, but rather family. Again, I want to say for all of us, we've been processing our reaction to a Judaism after October 7th. And one of the hardest, the most difficult, frankly, such evil, is the denial of women experience their victimhood in Israel. Gender-based violence that their rape, their murder, for some reason, doesn't count in the eyes of the world. I owe everything to Jewish women in my life. My mother reared me to become the man I am today, and she was the one who was responsible who set me up with the love of my life, my wife, Rachel. Again, I can't speak to how Jewish women have played such an importance in my life. In Bereshit, the first book of the Torah, it's a story about the power of what Jewish bring, women bring to our life. Born perfectly into the covenant, responsible for Jewish life inside the home and also outside the home. And for human rights organizations to deny their experiences, it's personal. I think it's personal for all of us. I'm looking out in front of this congregation. I know. There are women in your lives, Jewish women, some who are no longer here, who are instrumental in the person in which you became. Some of you are here for their yard sites. Some of you are still sad of their passing. Some of you still try to live the legacy that they live behind, but again, My incredible mother, my brilliant and beautiful wife, my wife, a brilliant mother too. And when Lillian was born, we didn't know the gender. A Batzion, a daughter of Israel. Lillian and Maisie. 
again to deny their experience in Israel is one of the greatest evils that we have seen. I had hope last week. I had a glimmer of hope. When the three professors, when the three presidents from the University of Pennsylvania, Harvard University, MIT, I truly thought at this moment that the ivory tower, the institutions that teach us about nuance, perspective, asking questions, institutions that are designed to complement our intellectual curiosities. I wanted these three people to testify in saying what we're seeing on college campuses is unacceptable. But most of us know that a response, it depends on the context. And then last Saturday night, at 11.30 at night, or 10.30 here, Saturday Night Live. And for those who grew up in the glory days of the show in the late 70s and 80s and 90s and early 2000s, it was, it was a beacon. It was the arbiter of democracy because it would be comedy that would hold politicians accountable by pointing out their imperfections and making fun of them. That's what Saturday Night Live is. And when the skit came on, I truly thought they were going to make fun of the three presidents. But they didn't. They were making fun of Elise Stefanik, who questioned these three presidents. Elise Stefanik became the joke, not the three presidents. I'm not one for boycotts. And if you want to watch Saturday Night Live, Hazaku Baruch. But again, it speaks to what I consider the mainstreaming of contemporary Jewish hate. For some reason, these presidents in Saturday Night Live, the Jewish people can't be victims anymore. And part of their theory, which is a virus in itself, is that Jews, especially in America, were able to assimilate, taking advantage of the system and becoming successful, primarily at the expense of someone else. If this was the case, and I reject this with prejudice, as an expert in contemporary Jew hatred, if this was the case, then why, after year after year after year, Jewish people are the number one victims of hate crime. I can't change Saturday Night Live. I'm not a head fund manager. I don't have the assets nor connections to make a serious dent in these universities who are not protecting student life. But that doesn't mean we stop trying. I think it's time for us to go on the offensive. For two months, we've been glued to the TV. And it's time for us to figure out what we're supposed to do next. So this sermon, it's for our Temple Emanuel College students. And frankly, I'm hopeful, and I want every college student in America to hear my words. I know that many of you are afraid. And I'm not going to tell you not to be afraid, because I do not, do not want to deny your experience. But I'm hearing too many times of seniors getting into top universities and not going because they feel unsafe. I know it sounds tougher here in the Bema and not in the ivory tower or the quad, 
but I'm not going to let college or any university have this win. There's absolutely no reason on earth that a Jewish student who studies hard, who makes the grades, engages in a bevy of extracurricular activities in order to excel her college resume to get in the college of choice, and she gets in, but she is greeted with such hate on campus, and therefore this university is deemed unsafe. I'm done with that. So to the college students of America, the Jewish college students, I want to remind you that 2,000 years of Jewish life has been tough. From the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE, the failure of Bokokhul's revolt in 135 CE, the Church Fathers, the complete subjugation and marginalization of Jews, us becoming the total other. Life was hard for the Jews, but do you know what we did? We studied. We studied the riches of the tradition, and we never lost hope of our tradition. We studied, we studied, we pursued the intellectual path to create a Judaism that can be sustainable even in darkness. The canonization of the Midrashim, Mishnah or Allah, followed by the Talmud, Shulchan Aruch, we use the power of our intellect to keep us grounded, to keep us rooted, and to give us hope. And for those who ever studied ancient Jewish law, it became the foundation of laws that we still uphold in society today. That is our contribution. So the first message to those college students, do not let these presidents, do not let the equity officers, do not let them stop you from fulfilling your mission to study, to learn, to ask questions. The better our college students engage in intellectual curiosity, in logic and reason, the sciences, this is what makes us stronger because we become smarter. It's a reason in the 1600s, Baruch Spinoza, someone who's excommunicated from, from Judaism, he believed that all people should have the belief to think freely without fear of coercion. To study new things and not to be threatened by the state. And it was Spinoza, followed by Kant, followed by Moses Mendelssohn and Thomas Jefferson, this idea of enlightened world that will bring hope. So denying Jewish women's experiences, that's a failure of the enlightenment. And now it's time for us as Jews and our college Jewish students to fight back with our brains. Not to give them a victory. To study harder, to advocate louder, and to hold your ground. If we were able to do this in the medieval period, I'm surely confident our college students can find a way to respond intellectually. The second course of action, how we go on the offensive. After talking to a dear mentor last night about the Jewish world, we both believe it is the obligation of every rabbi, every canner, every Jewish educator, every single Jewish professional to establish a Judaism after October 7th and what it will look like for us. We had to do this during the Shoah, the Holocaust, and now we are compelled to do it after October 7th. Cantor, Elizabeth, and I, we can't do it alone. So what I'm asking this congregation, and for those theoretically listening at home, I'm going to ask you to start studying again, to read more, to complement new texts for our intellectual curiosities, to be better students, to hold Jewish institutions accountable, meaning if they are not fulfilling their mission to establish a Jewish ethos post-October 7th, we have an obligation to hold them accountable. 
Himeta, Himeta, Himeta. She's dead, she's dead, she's dead. We are diasporic Jews. We can't go over there and join the IDF. I don't want us going to counter protests in the streets. I want us to begin knowing what we are good at. Seichel, common sense, education. We're going to do it for them, the Jewish women who were instrumental in our lives. And above all, we will decide what is real and what is truth and not what is taken out of context. Shabbat Shalom.